Good morning, boys in New Hope Church. Hope this message finds you all well. Hope you've all had a great day and a great week. Today we want to continue our conversation still in the book of 1 John. And today we look at chapter 2, verses 1 through 14. Last week we talked about the message that's proclaimed to us that we then proclaim to others, mainly being the gospel. And we also talked about um, what it means to walk in the light as he is in the light and what it means to love our neighbor. And we'll continue those themes as we go throughout the book of First John, um, but uh, that's continued uh, primarily here in chapter 2. And so starting in chapter 2, I just read the first two verses to get us started. It says this, it says, My dear children, I write this to you that you will not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. So we'll just stop there for a minute. I write this to you that if anyone does sin, if anyone sins, we have an advocate for the Father, Jesus Christ. You know, I think oftentimes we have that misconception that when we become Christians and receive the Holy Spirit, our life should be flawless and sinless and perfect from that point forward. But here John's letting us know that, look, if anyone sins, meaning that after you've received the Holy Spirit, you're following Jesus, but if you sin in that time, we still have an advocate. It isn't that we are now... Uh, kicked out of the kingdom of heaven. It's not that we have lost any salvation we might have had, um, if it, just because of one sin. But if anyone sins, we have an advocate, someone who will speak on our behalf, speak on our defense to the Lord. In this case, the righteous one, Jesus Christ. And if Jesus, being fully God and fully man, walked this earth and walked a sinless life to do a couple of things for us. Number one, to show that it can be done with the help of God. Number two, to show that he could then take the sin upon himself for us because he lived that sinless life. And so we have this advocate who understands our temptation but wasn't, <clears throat> didn't give in to that temptation, was without sin. And so we have this advocate, someone who knows our scenario, knows our feelings, knows our emotions so intimately. He knows those about us. He then can plead our case with the Father saying, no, no, I've got them covered. They belong in the kingdom of heaven. It's just an amazing blessing to stop and think about that, that this righteous one is advocating for us now if we do sin. And so it tells me that living a sinless life is not the requirement to get into the kingdom of heaven. And living a sinless life is not the requirement to get to the kingdom of heaven. But trusting in Jesus as your advocate would be that requirement. It just kind of flips everything on its head where it's not about what we can do, but it's about what Jesus has done for us. And I think that's always what we have to remember as followers of Jesus is that we follow him because he loves us, because he's forgiven us, because he guides us. It's not about anything we do, but it's because he has done all the work on our behalf already. And it's just an important point to remember and to think about our salvation and our sanctification. It just is an important point as we think through what God has done for us. So let's keep that in mind. Next part, verses 3 through 6, says this. It says, We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do as he commands, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But anyone who obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. And this is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus walked. And so this verse is kind of the transition between who Jesus is and what we're called to be. Um, and oftentimes it, the, the truth of the matter is, are we following Jesus? Are we doing as he commanded us to do? And I think that we get hung up a lot on that question of what is God commanded me? What has he called me to do in my life? Am I called to be a banker, to be a missionary, to be a construction worker? What am I called to do, Lord? I think that's kind of the wrong question we're asking ourselves. God didn't call us to a vocation. He called us to a lifestyle. He said, obey my commands. And so the question of the matter is, are we doing what Jesus asked us to do? And when we think about it, really, he asked us to tell others about him. Tell others that he is the way, the truth, and life. Tell others that he died for their sins. That would, that's what Jesus has called us to do, above and beyond any vocation we might experience, above and beyond any volunteer service we might be involved with. He's called us to share the gospel with others. And so when we think about that, that if we love Jesus, we'll obey his commands, that's what it means, that if we love God, we'll share him with others. 
So we're getting hung up on that question, but I think if we make it harder than it has to be, uh, are we loving him? Are we sharing him? As it says in verse 6, those who claim to live in him must walk as Jesus walked. And so if you think about that, what did Jesus do on this earth? He ate with sinners. He fed the hungry. He forgave sins. He provided reconciliation between man and God. He provided the forgiveness of those sins. So he really was the one who set the example for us. Jesus loved the unlovable, the outcast, the lowly of society, all for our benefit. So we could then go to the same. And so when we think about what, how did Jesus walk on this earth, that's how we should emulate him in this day, in this life daily. Is, and that's the kind of the, the standpoint we're looking at is, did Jesus call me to live a life, or rather he did call us to live a life of holiness, a life of love for God, love for our neighbor. Am I obeying him in that facet? Am I obeying him each day and loving God and loving my neighbor as myself? And so that's really what it comes down to is are we following Jesus in such a way that people see him in our lives or just following him in such a way that we just are nice people? One is very impactful for the kingdom of heaven. The other just makes us feel good. And so we got to make sure that as we follow Jesus, we're following him for the explicit purpose of making him known in this world. Otherwise, we're just a bunch of nice people and that doesn't honor the Lord as it should. <clears throat> Looking at the rest of our section, verses uh, 17 to 14, we'll read this. It says, Dear friends, I'm writing, I'm not writing a new commandment, but an old one, which you have heard since the beginning. <clears throat> this old commandment, sorry, this old command is the message you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new commandment. Its truth is seen in him and, he, and you, because the darkness is passing and the truth of light is already shining. <clears throat> Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in light, and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in darkness. He goes not knowing where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. <clears throat> I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you have known the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. So when we think about this, our command is to love God and love our neighbor as ourselves. That's the command that was given in the Old Testament, and that's the command given in the New Testament, is to obey that commandment, to love God, love others. But as we see that it's one of those things that if we have darkness in us, we can't see clearly to do that. I mean, if we have that sin that's not laid bare before the Lord, that's not asked to be forgiven, we have that darkness hidden within us, it makes us blind and we stumble around. We can't be effective for God. <clears throat> so it's really a quite a statement he makes here that, look, if you're going to be this reflection of Christ in this world, if you're going to shine his light to others around you, you can't be walking in darkness and say, I'm doing this at the same time. You can't walk in one way, walk in sin one day and proclaim to show the love of God the next. And I'm not talking about those sins that come up as we live life. I'm not talking about those accidents and mistakes. I'm talking about an intentional life of sin. Because we just read at the start of this passage that um, if anyone sins, we have an advocate for the Father. I think that if is important that if we have to understand that as we confess those sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us. We've all heard that before. And so it's not a matter of, or I guess it comes down to a matter of our attitude. Is our attitude one of repentance, one of contrition when we sin, or is an attitude one of selfishness and pride saying, oh, I'm okay over here, and I'll still shine the light of Jesus over here. And so really it's a very important point to remember as we look at this passage that this command Jesus gives us to walk in the light, to be the light of the world, to not to overcome the darkness. It's really a command to love others. But we can't do that if we're only doing it halfway. We can't be effective in loving others if we're not doing the whole of that love, both for God and for others. As he says in the end here, he writes, because our sins are forgiven, because we know the command given to us, and we know that we have the ability to overcome the evil one. He reiterates those points twice in these last few verses. 
that we've known this command from the beginning. We've had the same command in the Old, excuse me, in the Old Testament and the New Testament. He says, your sins have been forgiven because Jesus is that uh, sacrifice, the atonement for our sins. And then he writes, because we have given the ability to overcome the evil one in this world. So he's really trying to encourage the people, and John is trying to encourage the early church here that, look, you live in this world, and it's a dark place, and it's a hard place, and it's a rough place at times. But we have the ability to live a life of love that honors the Lord and honors others and helps other people know who Jesus is. So that's really John's point in this passage, that we have the ability, we have the God-given ability to love others effectively. And if we sin, we have an advocate to help us take care of that sin. So that sin is not going to be a hindrance to the gospel message. And so really it's a very um, uniform passage, but it's also a very much one that says, look, it provides hope for us that, hey, look, if we're living this Christian life, if we're following Jesus and we're having a struggle, that struggle does not define us. Rather, the love of God should be what defines us to others and to him. And so I hope that encourages you today. Lord, we do thank you for this morning, this time together. God, we just pray that as we go through this life, Lord, that our our love of you and our love of others would shine through. And Lord, that's not always easy. It's not always fun. But God, if we love you, we'll obey your command. Lord, if we love you, we'll walk in the light as you are in the light. Lord, if we love you, we'll do what you ask us to do. So Lord, help us to do those things you ask us to do. Help us to love our neighbor as you love them, God. And that's not easy sometimes. But Lord, give us that strength that your spirit would empower us to live a holy and sanctified life. Lord, we do thank you for the work you do in us. Father, we love you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as always, thanks for joining me. I'm glad you did. Next week, we'll finish up uh, chapter 2 of First John here. But until that time, remember that God loves you and we're a blessed people. <laughs>